Thomas Beale, CTO of Ocean Informatics and one of the architects of OpenAir. This is part 5 of the ADL 1.5 course. We're going to talk about structural constraints, that is, the main constraints that you can express above the primitive uh, leaf level. So some of the topics we'll cover. <coughs> Aspects of constraining structure to do with attributes, so existence, cardinality, something new called occurrences, internal references, a new type of constraint in AD1.5 called group constraint, also some type related constraints and some value related constraints including default and example values. Just to remind you, at least those among you who are technical, this is the archetype object model, section 5 uh, includes this part of the model. This part deals with the main definition part of an archetype, that is the, uh, the technical constraint part. So, in this part of the course we'll look at the highlighted classes. So you might remember C object, C attribute and C complex object down the bottom there. They're the main types to enable you to build uh, constraints of any size of hierarchy. The class C defined object contains a number of attributes uh, which enable us to do some specific types of constraining and add in default values, assumed values. And on the left there you can see archetype internal ref, so that's a type to do with enabling a uh, constraint to express an internal reference within an archetype. So let's just think about what typical object models enable us to build. The normal basic idea is that you will get hierarchies of structure. You may get cross references or linkages between and across uh, elements from different hierarchies, in other words graph cycles, but we're not going to worry about that uh, in this course. There are ways to constrain uh, those kind of structures. For the moment we're just going to stick to the normal run-of-the-mill structure. So hierarchical structure there, you can see that's an archetype for medication description and you can see a number of uh, items, name of medication, generic name, and then it goes deeper into more detailed structures and elements to do with dose. The classes from the class model, this could be, it happens to be open air, but it could be 13606 and it would be easy to find an equivalent in HL7 CDA or other similar models. Uh, in OpenAir in 13606 the approximate list of classes you can see element and clusters containing elements. Uh, the item tree class at the top is an OpenAir specific one but essentially it's the same thing as another cluster. The UML diagram of that, uh, at least the cluster element part, is, is shown there and for those of you who are uh, object models, modelers, you'll realize that's one of the most basic patterns that exists, a tree building pattern. Here's another typical hierarchy. This one is based on the observation class in OpenAir. You can read down the left hand side observation. That's a class, data, property, history, class, events, property, and so on and so on. And eventually you get down into the elements to do with, in this case, blood pressure, so systolic uh, and diastolic. You can see that the systolic uh, element constraint is further opened out into a quantity constraint. The class diagram for that is shown there, so there are more classes involved, but the point is that eventually everything turns into hierarchy. So the classes and properties implicated in that are these two, C attribute and C complex object. You'll see that C complex object has a property called attributes uh, and C attribute has a property called children that enables it to contain multiple different types of C object. If those children are more C complex objects then they can contain in turn more C attributes and that's how you build up a structure, a large structure. So the basic rule of constraining in 
archetype land is archetype constraints cannot violate the underlying reference model. They are constraints. That means that they narrow the inbuilt constraints. Now some of you might not have ever thought about the fact that a, an information model is something that actually has its own constraints. If you think about property and attribute type, imagine if you had a class person and it has a property name and it's of type string, that is essentially a constraint. It could have been of type any, which would have meant the name could be of different uh, a number of different types. Making it string constrains it. In the same way, if the notional person class and name attribute or name property had a multiplicity of, let's say, one, one to one, in other words, mandatory, that's a constraint. It could have been zero to star. So these basic uh, parts of a normal object model can be thought of as constraints. Inheritance relations also provide certain types of constraining. So the basic rule of constraining in archetypes is that we can't break whatever the given in reference information model says. Archetype constraints can therefore only narrow these existing constraints. An attribute type uh, is uh, either has to be a reference model declared type or a descendant, that is in, in the correct place in the archetype. Multiplicity can be constrained in the following two ways. Existence, well existence is something which uh, isn't particularly cleanly modelled in UML, it's normally conflated with cardinality and to just a single range. But if you think about whether, some, whether an attribute can actually exist or not or whether it would be allowed to be null, that is a typical thing you might find in a reference model. You might find that it's set to 1 to 1 or 0 to 1. If it's 0 to 1, an archetype could reasonably constrain it to 1 to 1, that is make it mandatory, or 0 to 0, which means to prohibit it. In the same way, cardinality, which applies to container properties, you might see a typical constraint uh, on the information model of 0 to star, or 1 to star, or 1 to n. It's the same thing. A, an archetype can therefore constrain 0 to star into 1 to star, that's narrower, or 1 to 5, or 2, and so on. So the archetype can only make things narrower. It can't create data structures which the underlying reference model wouldn't itself allow. If you're building an archetype and the reference model does what you need, 0 to 1 or 1 to star or whatever, and that's what you need, then you don't need to do anything in the archetype. So the archetype concept is to override things or to further constrain them. So we looked at the AOM uh, UML just before. This is an object structure of AOM objects. In other words, if an archetype was passed into memory, it's going to have a structure like this. And I've marked the top one on the left there, reference RM type name observation. So this is just a series of mainly C complex objects and C attribute, C complex objects, C attribute. So the first thing that might now become be apparent to you is that C attributes are a first class object in this constraint structure. And one of the reasons is to enable us to constrain things to do with the attributes themselves. So that attribute there has reference model attribute name of data and we set a constraint, if you can, you can think of it as a, a meta attribute, it's an attribute of the AOM C attribute class is multiple to true. That's saying that the data class in the ref, the, the data attribute in the reference model data property is uh, a container object. So it can contain multiple objects. You can see there it contains uh, a C complex object and an archetype slot object. The next one down you can see the C attribute with existence equals one, that means it's mandatory. 
cardinality of 1 to star, that means it's also a container object, and is multiple equals true. The second one just below, cardinality range from 1 to 5 and is multiple is true. Now the reason you might be wondering, well, isn't it obvious that uh, is multiple is has to be true if the cardinality is, is set to a certain value? But don't forget, we're only putting constraints where they're actually needed. It could easily be the case that the C attribute has no cardinality in this archetype because the cardinality of the reference model, the information model, is what we need. So we still need a marker to say that this is a container attribute so that we know, in other words, the tooling can know what is allowed to go below it. And the last C attribute down there on the bottom right has is multiple equals false. That means it's a single valued attribute. It corresponds to an attribute that can only that isn't a container and can only have one object. You'll notice that it has two child uh, constrainer objects in this AOM structure. So we'll we'll get on to understanding all this. All reference model attributes can have existence constrained. That simply states mandatory or prohibited. So you saw that before, zero to one being constrained into one or zero. It's typically only constrained to remove optional items in a template or it may be to mandate items. Uh, now when I say items I mean attributes, so a, a whole tree under a certain attribute. The next thing to understand is uh, for multiply valued reference model attributes, we said before they're containers, they can have cardinality constrained. So we start to understand that between a single valued and a container a uh, attribute, there is a meaning for multiple child objects in an archetype. If it's a container attribute, something like items or person dot names, that kind of idea, then the AOM objects under that attribute, under that C attribute, specify possible siblings that would be allowed. If it's a single valued attribute, it specifies possible alternatives. So, just as a little reminder, there's a part of a of the open air uh, reference model. It's very, very similar to a part of the, yeah, at least an intention, of the ISO 13606 reference model. So there's a composition consisting of a context, some content, and a number of other bits and pieces off to the right there. Single-valued attributes, just to take some examples, is composition.composer and event context dot start time, also event context dot healthcare facility. These attributes in real data can only have either nothing or a single object as the value. Multiply valued attributes, i.e. containers, are these ones here. So zero to star content items inside a composition or zero to star po uh, participations inside an event context object. So a constraint on a single valued attribute could look like this. The uh, relationship type node there is a, it's an element from the reference model, the demographic reference model in OpenAir. There's a value attribute, it's a single valued attribute, and yet there are two constraints. So these are two alternatives. That one there, the bottom one, means a coded text. The top one means that a, a plain text would also be acceptable. If you were looking in CKM, you would see uh, this kind of thing, relationship type and a, a little symbol that's like a switch. So you, it's a choice kind of concept. It's exactly the same thing. The ADL for that is very simple. Element, you remember the AT codes, they indicate the conjunction between a class name and an AT code tells what that uh, object instance means in this part of the archetype. The value attribute, single valued attribute, matches, and here are our two possibilities, a DV text, in this case it just matches anything, and DV coded text, which matches 
defining, in this case, a defining code with uh, a particular archetype code set. It could have been anything else. So the meaning here is that either DB text or DB coded text would be acceptable possibilities in the real data. It can only be one of them. Here's a variant on that concept. Here we have, you can see the information on the right hand side is a class XXXX which has an attribute counterparty of type party. The fragment of ADL on the left shows that counterparty in the data could be con is constrained to being either a party or a person. Now you can see on the right hand side that person is in fact a subtype of party. So what this constraint is saying is that uh, the data must match either a person object matching that person block, so with the date of birth matching whatever, or else any other kind of party object. If it's a person object it has to match that uh, more specific person constraint. Applications could potentially detect this and show the more specific type that is person as preferred in some way. Now we have to keep remembering that archetypes are essentially about objects, not classes. They're not refined class models. They're something like a uh, object possibility model. So we have an additional possibility for multiply valued attributes. How many times in the data can an object matching each child occurs? occur. So look at this example. The C complex object uh, RM type name cluster, so some sort of cluster of elements. This archetype is saying uh, that in that C attribute cardinality is 1 to 5, so it can have 1 to 5 children. Multiple is multiple is true, it's a container attribute and uh, well you can see the reference model attribute name is items and the archetype is saying that there is one element uh, constrainer object, its node ID equals test name, and another one, uh, another element, this node ID means panel item. Of course they're actually AT codes but here we're just showing the meaning in English. And what we can do is set something called occurrences on those two objects. That's saying in the data how many times could that test name uh, element occur and it's 0 to 1. You might argue that it maybe should be 1 to 1 but it's not going to be more than 1. But the second one, the panel item, would typically be uh, 0 to something or perhaps 1 to something, 1 to n. In this case it's 0 to 4. So some actual data that would correspond to this is a cluster containing three elements, an uh, element whose name is cholesterol, probably should say cholesterol test, uh, that's the test name, and two elements, one is the uh, HDL LDL ratio and the other is the total, and those two conform to the second element uh, panel item, so those, those, those two are panel item elements. Now you can see here that one archetype with occurrences set on it in different ways on different C complex objects, or in fact any C object, means that the data might have multiple elements conforming to just one of those archetype objects. And that means that the occurrences constraint is quite a powerful constraint because in realistic object models there are numerous container attributes and you only want to constrain, state the constraints of what kind of objects can go inside once but you need to have the flexibility to say how many types, how many instances of each of those types could occur. So that's what occurrences does. And you can see that the totality of the list in the data, which is three elements long, fits in the cardinality constraint one to five. So here's another example. You can see in the uh, cardinality occurrences column on an object node it means occurrences and there's occurrences zero to one of systolic pressure inside 
the blood pressure measurement archetype. You might argue that it should be uh, one, uh, one to one. Uh, that's that's a design choice that's been made in a template. It'll undoubtedly be made one to one. Here's another example. This is the body weight archetype, and it shows that the weight element has no occurrences set. So what does this mean? Well, if we consider the items attribute above it, which is a, clearly a container attribute, uh, because it's defined that way in the item tree class. In this case, the cardinality has been set to 1, and that means that the occurrences is actually 0 to 1 for the weight uh, element below it. In other words, if there can only be one child in the data, there could only be 1 or 0 weight uh, elements. There might be 1 comment if there was no weight and so on. So we can infer the occurrences from the cardinality in some cases and in this case we don't have to actually say anything in particular for the occurrences of the weight element. And here's a final example. We have the findings part of the uh, open air observation audiogram archetype. This says the cardinality has to be at least two of the findings elements. There are three findings elements. You can see ear, frequency and hearing level. So the ear, in other words which ear, we say that the currents is, is one. So that's required. Obviously anything else that you might say about the uh, that part of the test, such as the frequency and the hearing level, it doesn't make sense without saying which ear we're actually talking about. Now we come to something new in ADO 1.5 that didn't exist in ADL and AOM 1.4. The requirement here is to control subgroups within a container attribute in the way that's actually been possible in basic XML for a very long time. Here you can see an example. The item tree class, uh, well that is the archetype saying an instance of the item tree class, has items attribute that matches and then a set of elements and also clusters. Now you can see a new type of constraint there, the group keyword and cardinality and occurrence is set on it. That's controlling the uh, number of times and the way in which those contained uh, two elements and cluster can occur within the overall group. So the first two elements at the top uh, AT, triple oath, 2 and 3, that is investigation type and reason. The first one is mandatory, the second one is optional. That's simple enough. The last two are both optional, also simple. The group part in the middle is saying we have to have one and one only of those possible children. Each of the children inside has occurrences of 0 to 1, so they are optional but in the data one of them must be there. The occurrences statement in the group line in blue there is 0 to 1 so it means that the overall group may or may not be there. If it is there it has to have one element and that element has to be one of those three children. Here's another example. We have two uh, nested group constructs. So if you look at the outside, the outer attribute items, ultimately what it can contain is just elements and clusters, but the grouping here is uh, forcing it into a particular shape. So the uh, first group construct is saying essentially pick any two and optionally repeat what's in that group. Then and one of the things that could be repeated is in fact uh, a pair of element and cluster which has its own little group construct and that inner group construct is saying pick one uh, but the overall thing is optional that's the occurrences matching zero to one on that group line there so at least one of these is required if this whole uh, group is included. So the effect of this is that it's optionally one thing and the one thing could be one of these two here. 
and the overall, the outer group construct is saying pick any two and repeat. That's what the uh, occurrences matching star means. Pick any two of this one, this one, this one, or the, re the result of this one here, and that could repeat itself a number of times within this overall collection of sibling objects. In the specification you will find uh, a table like this showing what the possible meanings of different group constraint cardinality and occurrences and also item occurrences combinations are. For example, just to pick uh, two examples, the n of m choice rows of the table. If you want to enable an n of m choice the group cardinality is n. The upper limit of the group occurrences is 1. Now, it might be 0 to 1 or it might be 1 to 1 depending on whether the whole thing is optional or not. Uh, and each of the item occurrences will be 0 to 1. If you want the same thing but to allow that n of m choice to be repeating, so maybe 2 out of 5 things but then you could keep repeating that pattern, the group occurrences will be greater than one. The part of the AOM that enables this is the C object group class that you see there. It's got its own cardinality and occurrences as you can see. It also has lower and upper index uh, values. These are indexes into the list of children under a given attribute. We come now to some essentially value-related constraints that can occur in the overall structure. The first one is called assumed values. The requirement is to be able to state a value for a data point that can be assumed if no value is found in the data. In other words, the data point will be optional if uh, an application receives uh, data perhaps created by another application it will look in the archetype to see what the value of uh, any data point that has an assumed value set for it for which no actual data instance was found. So an example is patient position for blood pressure measurement. You can see there that the patient position is coded. It could be standing, sitting, reclining, lying, lying with tilt to the left. So these are various meaningful positions of the patient while having blood pressure measured. It's the sitting one is marked as assumed. And to see how we do that in ADL, you'll see it's very simple. On all of the leaf node types, such as in this case uh, the C code phrase plugin type that you've come across before, we have the ability to add, uh, indicate an assumed value, which must be one of the set, simply by putting a semicolon in the list. The same thing can be done with ordinal, the ordinal plug-in type and there are ways to do it with quantity uh, type as well. It hasn't been done previously but it may end up being the case that uh, we would allow assumed values for larger structures inside the archetype model. And there it is there, it's enabled on the class C defined object Another useful thing is something called default values, which is new in ADO 1.5. The requirement here is to be able to state a value for a data point that will be used as the value if the user or application doesn't input anything. So in this case the value is going to be set at runtime and the default value is going to say what that value is. It might be zero or whatever. That's different from assumed values. With an assumed value no value is going to be set at runtime. The archetype has to be looked up to see what the assumed value is. Default values haven't currently been implemented in the uh, ADA 1.5 workbench, but uh, we can look at how it will probably be implemented. There may be uh, a need for a syntax variation. You can see there uh, value square brackets default in two locations with a particular value. There's also something uh, next to it, value square brackets example, and the example concept is uh, would be implemented the same way, and the concept 
is to allow domain modelers to propose uh, to include reasonable example values. So not just default values that would be set at runtime if no data was input, but an example value. And the, the utility of this is to allow reasonable example instances to be generated mainly for education and testing purposes. So this uh, has mainly come out of the CIMI, uh, that's the Clinical Information Modeling Initiative Forum, and you can see the URL for that if you want to visit it just below. So there's a default value. If uh, we implement example value, it will undoubtedly go right next to it in the same way. You can see that it's defined on C defined objects, which is a parent type of C complex object. That means default values and, and example values could potentially be of complex object types, not just primitive types. Now we come to something called internal references. The requirement here is to reuse an existing definition subtree from elsewhere in the archetype. And the easiest way to understand it is simply to look at an example. So APGAR is a good example. You can see the structure here, uh, the group of elements starting with respiratory effort, heart rate and so on. Uh, in APGAR, the way it works is that there are usually two samples. Or there's provision typically made for four, uh, but samples, for example, at one minute, maybe two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, that kind of thing. The sample at each one of those points in time includes a value for each of the data points, respiratory effort, heart rate, and so on. So at any of the sample times, the data set is exactly the same. So for the two minute and three minute, five minute, ten minute uh, archetype specifications, we would normally be forced to repeat this whole section here. Now obviously we don't want to do that, so we allow this internal reference and that says that in this uh, one here the data here match and we just point to the object from the one minute sample and say it's the same as this. In the ADL this looks as follows. You can see uh, two of the lower level uh, sample definitions, that is two minute and three minute. Each of them in the data property have uh, a specification starting with the keyword use node which simply says use, then it says the reference model type item list which happens to be the original uh, object type in the one minute sample, the first sample, and then it has a path. So these two uh, parts of the archetype simply reuse something that was over. We can go and have a look in the tool to see the effect of this. Here's the definition of those first set of data points, including the total, and the five data points that go to make up the total. Here are the definitions of, you can see the first two uh, further samples, that is two minute and three minute, and for each of them the data are just constrained to be this object here. That's what this path is saying. If we go and look at the path set, that is the extracted path set for the whole archetype, you can see that these paths here are all the one minute paths, that is heart rate and so on, total there, skin color, etc., to do with the first one minute sample. The tool uh, and the, the compiler, of course, interprets the use ref reference to mean that uh, for two minute we should of course end up with uh, the effect of archetype objects that uh, then give us the same set of possible paths and you can see that we can generate a rather large amount of possibilities by using internal references in this way. Here we can see in the AOM the archetype internal ref class so it's very simple and it just contains a target path indicating where else in the same archetype to find the uh, object constraint that the path refers to. So, let's summarize. The AOM provides semantics for constraining any hierarchy of data objects 
you can constrain the, the reference model or information model type, the attribute existence and cardinality, the occurrences on objects within container attributes. We can constrain subgroups within siblings uh, of a container attribute. We can include default and example values. And all of this gives us the ability to build an archetype of, of serious complexity. But nevertheless, just one archetype. Obviously, we need to be able to do more than that. So what's coming up is componentization and reuse. How do we build multiple archetypes and connect them? How do we specialize and reuse archetypes in the inheritance sense? And finally, we will get on to templating. As before, please have a look at the specifications for detailed explanations and for some details that I haven't included in this course segment. Thanks very much for your attention, and I hope to have you in the next segment of the course.